Welcome to the September Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting uh, under the Hyperledger umbrella. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets Special Interest Group and the Hyperledger Foundation. They're the group that really makes these meetings possible, so I always like to say thank you to them. Okay. Um, as always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and is under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation, as I just mentioned, and to please abide by the antitrust policy that I'm sharing on the screen and the code of conduct. The antitrust policy states that we avoid discussions of company specific pricing products and projects. We don't make negative remarks about other companies or other products. And the code of conduct means that we treat each other with respect never discriminate, communicate constructively, and we fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion. If you're a new participant to this meeting, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat. If there are any items that you'd like to discuss, please let us know. The more interaction we have, the richer the discussion is. So thank you and welcome to everyone. Here's our agenda for today. We've already gone through the welcome and housekeeping. There's a brief Hyperledger community information uh, portion. Then James is gonna discuss the state of the blockchain in the mortgage, global mortgage industry. We have a demonstration and a discussion of the IPBS wallet and a mortgage industry example from James Soning and Casey Rock. And then we'll go over some future agenda topics. So with that, uh, we always like to start off with this same set of slides because we want to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain journey. I know people that have been here have heard me say this multiple times. This group is meant to help everyone on their blockchain journey to demonstrate the feasibility of blockchain technology through mortgage industry use cases. We're going to see one of those today and to define potential implementation paths. We're all on the same journey, we're just at different points. Okay, uh, some brief Hyperledger information. I just wanted to remind everyone that the Hyperledger Global Forum for 2022 is in Dublin, Ireland from September 12th to the 14th. So if you wanna get your pint of Guinness, head on over to Dublin. There is going to be some some of it that it'll be virtual. So uh, please look into it. I think it's a great opportunity to find out what's going on in Hyperledger. The next three slides, I always mention for those that are new to the group, this first one is just a site map that shows some of the links that provide information on Hyperledger. The second one from the bottom there is the financial markets mortgage subgroup wiki. So take a look at that one if you're new. Uh, also, if you do want to access some of this information, you'll need an LFID. So this slide shows you how to do that. And then the last one is just some free blockchain training. I always mention that I've taken this and it was very helpful for me. So please avail yourself of this information. Well, with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to James Hendrick and he's going to go over the state of blockchain and the global mortgage industry. Take it away, James. Marvin, thank you very much. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the first slide. So here's the uh, global mortgage blockchain activity that we've been reporting on over the last couple of years. Um, 2022, you can see we've done a variety of different articles spanning across pretty much every continent on the uh, planet. You know, as we get into uh, this month's updates, I want to talk about CB Insights and their recent release of the State of the Blockchain Report, as well as some information going on in uh, the UK with Barclays. Marvin, next slide. All right, for the state of the blockchain Q2 report. Um, so back in January, we uh, published or um, we posted to the wiki page the 2021 annual blockchain report from CB Insights. It's an extremely valuable report. They're very detailed, 150, 200 pages long or so, and it breaks down blockchain activity that is going on across industries, via countries, um, pretty much every way that you want to slice and dice it. You know, some of the big things that came out of the Q2 report summarized 
recognizing the first two quarters of this year. Um, there was 1.4 billion record blockchain funding in Europe these first two quarters. Europe was the only global region with growth in blockchain venture funding and deals. 52% of deal growth in infrastructure and development, one of the only blockchain spaces with real deal growth in Q2 of 2022, reaching a new high of 47 deals. And then in Silicon Valley, they represented 28% share of all the US funding. Um, with uh, New York following closely 678 million um, and Los Angeles with 492 million. But not all is dreamy in crypto land. The report also talks about what's happening in the crypto markets. There's a 29% drop in global crypto funding. Blockchain venture funding fell to 6.5 billion and investors scaled back crypto investments due to macroeconomic pressures and concerns about crypto valuations. We also saw a 40 a 54% decline in mega round dollars. Blockchain fell to 2.6 billion, suggesting that investors were more cautious due to the crypto winter and the recent price volatility. So a lot of great information in that report. If you're looking to gather up stats or infos to help support the projects and initiatives that you're looking at, I would definitely take a look at the CB Insights report. Also coming out of the UK, um, Barclays is among a group of new investors joining a funding round for Copper. Copper provides custody, prime brokering, and settlement services to institutional investors, deploying money into crypto assets. Copper has drawn investments from big names in the global venture capital sector, such as Local Globe, Don Capital, and MMC Ventures. And Barclays is expected to invest a rel relatively modest sum in the millions of dollars as a part of the round. All of this is occurring while a number of major marketing participants, including Three Arrows Capital and Celsius, which you'll have, hear me mention later, um, have filed for bankruptcy in the most recent weeks. Um, Marvin, moving on to the next slide. So in the US sector, we've had a lot of different stuff going on. Um, again, here's our updates from what we've been talking about this year in 2022. Uh, Marvin, next slide. So two of the key articles that I pulled out for um, this month, the first one is with JP Morgan. So they released their annual summer reading. Um, this year's collection is available for visitors in the virtual lounge Decentraland. Now, we've talked previously about Decentraland. I think it was back in around uh, March or so of this year. In fact, we had a whole presentation in March with Mark D'Angelo talking about the meta universe. JP Morgan and other companies are estimating the metaverse to represent a $1 trillion market opportunity. So you're starting to see more and more banks actually take advantage of it. In fact, Quatonic Bank, which is a New York City-based digital bank, opened up a Quatonic outpost in Decentralized. Uh, land last month. And you can actually see in the picture here in the upper left, that's a picture from Decentraland of the Quatonic Bank outpost. Um, Quatonic claims to be the first U.S. bank to offer its customers a Bitcoin rewards program, a feature the bank launched in 2020. And they also claim to be the first bank to introduce a tap to pay mobile payment ring to the U.S. market. Uh, product that they officially rolled out in April, and I actually had to go research and find out what that was, and it's literally what it sounds like. It's a ring that allows you to walk up to a kiosk and pay, much like you do with tapping your phone or, or tapping a credit card. Um, what was kind of fun about this is to mark the occasion, uh, Quatonic Bank hosted a virtual launch party for the space, which they included a, a DJ, they had non-fungible token giveaways and things like that. So people are really, companies are really starting to take uh, advantage of the metaverse. And then the last article I've got for today is um, talking about seven different companies that are uh, in the mortgage and DLT industries. So this article was just recently updated again in June of this year, and it talks about companies like Liquid Mortgage, Figure, WeTrust, that we previously talked about uh, throughout this year in our presentations. 
couple of the other companies I wanted to highlight that they talk about, um, there's Unchained Capital out of Austin, Texas. They lend cash to long-term cryptocurrency holders. The crypto owners leverage their Bitcoin or Ether for loans anywhere from three to, thir or three to 60 months with interest rates, interest rates ranging from eight to 14%. The uh, Unchained Capital holds the crypto in a blockchain secured vault requiring permissions of both the borrower, the company, and a third party to avoid any single point of failure. And they offer loans for personal, small business, as well as real estate use. Uh, Salt, which is out of Denver, Colorado, they're also a company that use blockchain's flexibility to offer cash loans that leverage digital assets. You know, similar, their loans can be up to 36 months with an APR as low as 5.99%. And they are available for business in almost every state in the US and are now expanding to New Zealand, Brazil, UK, and Switzerland. BlockFi is another one of the companies out of New York. They're a lending platform that uses crypto as collateral. Borrowers can receive 12 month cash loans by leveraging their Ether, Litecoin, or Bitcoin. And then I thought it was also interesting, this, as I mentioned, this article was updated in June, and they do talk about Celsius, which, as you heard me mention uh, a couple articles ago, Celsius now is actually in the, the process of filing bankruptcy. Celsius was providing cash loans exceeding 5,000, um, allowing uh, customers to use Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and Ripple tokens as collateral. The company loan started at 5% or 5 APR, and a borrower receives all of their crypto back upon making their final payment. It'll be interesting to see now that in the last couple of weeks since Celsius moved into bankruptcy, what's actually going to wind up uh, happening with that company and what we'll see them doing in the future. So more to come as we keep an eye on them. Marvin, next slide. And just a quick update, this is our wiki page. Um, all the resource articles I mentioned are on the right-hand side of the page. Um, in fact, if you scroll down the page uh, even farther on the right-hand side, that's where you're going to find the blockchain information and research section. That's where you'll see that CB Insight State of Blockchain report. And then, you know, over on the left hand side, we have sublinks in our groups that uh, provide information, have links to our previous meeting recordings, as well as the presentation. So if you missed out on any of those previous presentations I mentioned earlier, do come take a look at the wiki. They're all accessible directly from there. And in fact, um, for everybody's quick reference, I will go ahead in a moment and I will drop the uh, wiki into the chat as well so you can save it as a favorite link. And Marvin, that sums up my update for the month. Back over to you. Thanks, James. Uh, interesting information as always. Uh, it sounds like there are some headwinds that are emanating from uh, the crypto space. So always keeps yeah. life interesting. Absolutely. Uh, uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce James Schoening and Casey Rock from the IM Project. Uh, James leads the Linux Foundation IM Project, chairs the IEEE Ontology Standards Working Group is an, and is an advocate for self-sovereign identity and personal data stores. Casey Rock is a computer scientist with the US Army Futures Command Working Group, excuse me, uh, doing cybersecurity R&D. Uh, both James and Casey introduced the integrated personal data store uh, in a previous meeting, and now they're going to talk about a mortgage specific application. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Take it away, uh, James and Casey. Okay, um, thank you. I'm, I'm going to uh, pre present a few slides, and then Casey is going to uh, present a live demonstration of some of our technology. <clears throat> but now let's let's come back to the mortgage industry, to the, uh, to actually, you know, what this working group was formed. This, you know, as I understand it, this group was formed because there's this vision of how blockchain and verifiable credentials and some of the other, uh, you know, web 3.0 technologies could, um, could bring about changes in the mortgage industry. And, and, um, I share that vision. I think Casey does too. And uh, but but today we're gonna we're gonna share a 
perhaps a slightly different perspective on the same ecosystem. And that's the nice thing about ecosystems. There's a lot of parts to an ecosystem. There's a lot of players and there's a lot of different perspectives. So uh, we're gonna introduce a new one uh, and we're going to um, propose an actual pilot. You know, we saw um, Marvin's chart, you know, you <coughs> start with an idea and at some point you get to where you're ready for a pilot. So we're gonna be proposing a pilot and to just give you a, a quick uh, preview, it's a pilot that's user centric where a user has a, a, an identity wallet that's, that also stores all of their personal data and they, they collect this data, they collect credentials and eventually you know, and, and if they are a motivated borrower, you know, if they're looking to take out a mortgage, they collect all the information <clears throat> and then they are in a position to, to go out for quotes, to post, post somewhere on the internet, I am interested in quotes for my mortgage. I'm gonna pause for one second to, uh, to cough for a second. C Casey, what, could you give a little introduction here? Yeah, so one of the things that we've realized when it comes to these different types of blockchains and verifiable credentials is that you realize that there are standard ways to represent the metadata or the header data of these verifiable credentials. And this is gonna be talking about the credential ID, the, the timestamp when it was created. And W3C has created a, a um, standard for that. Now the, the, the part where we've, realized is one of the big problems with these verifiable credentials is they are specifically designed for the model that the issuer uses. So if you think about it, when somebody issues a credential, they use their own data model inside the credential to represent what information they want. Now, the holder of that wallet will then share the, share the information and receive the credential. Now, the thing is that we've realized is if that holder of the verifiable credential wants to go to another organization, they'd have the other organization would have to reflect the same data model that the issuer provided. There's this inconsistency. So one of the things that we'll be showing today in our demo is how we solve this inconsistency with adding a standard to the data attribute layer of a verifiable credential. Jim, was there anything that you wanted to... Uh, yeah, I, I can. I, I've stopped coughing, so I can take over <laughs> again. Um, could I share um, some charts here? Um, right now, it's telling me that I. Okay, so now let me share. Um, all right, can you see my charts? That's my last chart. So let me uh, go to my. Can you see my charts? Yes. yes. Yeah, we can see. Okay. That. Okay, all right. So um, just like the mortgage, just like this community has a vision for the future mortgage, the vision we're coming from is, is that the individual has a multi-purpose wallet. They have one wallet. Today, there's a lot of wallet projects, but for every project, you get a, the user gets another wallet. There's no general purpose wallets. But the industry is moving towards that, you know, this, the interoperable standards, which we're part of, are um, working towards the vision of person has one, one digital wallet <clears throat> that includes both their, it's an identity wallet for their credentials, but it's also a personal data store. Um, and, and it stores their data and the data is integrated on, I'll explain that. Okay, so what we envision is, is um, when a person is uh, ready to apply for a mortgage, they already have most of what they need um, in order. They already have a lot of the data, a lot of their identity. You know, maybe they've already proven their income and who they work for and where they live and what property property they might own. They already have most of it. Uh, so that's gonna make it a lot easier. And, and then when they need a mortgage, if they have all this data and if there are standards, because the, the data has to be collected to a standard, um, then, then they can, uh, you know, post somewhere. I'm open for bids from to lend me money from for my mortgage, <clears throat> and um, so that's a slightly different paradigm, and that's the different perspective. But now we'll go, we'll start to go through what technology our team has that that makes this possible. 
Um, <clears throat> right now, verifiable credentials is that te that technology is moving along quite well. In fact, there's standards for verifiable credentials that, but they stop when they get to the actual data that's inside a claim. So if you have a credential that says, I have an annual income of X, the, the existing standards don't standardize on what X is. Um, so that's where we, that's the work we're doing. And we're, we're not using schema technology, even though that's, that's state of the art, we're using a ontology or standard ontology. And I'll get to that in, in, in um, another couple slides. So uh, we're helping to create these standards that will enable um, uh, people to collect data in a standard format and reuse it for other purposes. Um, now, one of the problems with data is data is unique to its purpose. It's all, often called fit for purpose. Uh, it could work perfectly well within an application, but some other application gets a copy of that data, but can't tell what it means. You know, there's no semantics, you know. Um, now you can, you know, the small scale solution to that is um, you, you do a mapping from one application application to another, you map the terms in a data model. And that does work, but it just doesn't scale uh, because the more and more applications that want to reuse the same piece of data, you have to keep mapping it. And it actually scales at an N squared rate. <clears throat> so if N is less than five or three or four, you're okay. But if N gets to be 10, it's too much mapping. You really need a common hub. And that's where, um, that's part of our technology. Now, now the hub really cannot be a traditional data model. Uh, and I'm just gonna state that there's no time to prove it. If anybody wants to challenge whether a traditional data model could ever be a hub for any kind of data, I'd be happy to, to, to get in involved in a discussion on that. But I'm just gonna state that you can't be a traditional data model. However, however it could be, what we call an ontology, a, a, um, and I'll explain that in the following chart. Um, ontologies don't model data. Ontologies model reality, and reality actually does scale. <laughs> now, of course, when you model it, it you can kind of get to different perspectives, it's, but at least it starts with something that's scalable. Um, unless you want to go to quantum levels, then, then maybe reality is not what we think it is. But for the rest of us, reality is logically consistent and it does scale. And that's why these ontologies can scale. Um, ontologies are developed in, in a hierarchy. At the top, we have what we call the top level ontology. And, and this is something that um, just in the past year, we have achieved a ISO standard for a top level ontology. It's called the basic formal ontology. And that's kind of small. It, it just really gives the framework for more specific ontologies. But, but that was a huge leap because we proved we actually can standardize ontologies. And that's something that the semantic web claimed was not possible 20 years ago. And then Semantic Web came out. They said, you should never have standard ontologies. You should always have stovepipe ontologies and just connect them together. And I, and I think by, I think we've partially proven that you can have a standard ontology and many people can reuse it. The next level is the mid-level ontology. And this is, gets a lot bigger, about 1600 terms. And these are the terms that are commonly used across domains. If it's specific to a domain, that's the third level down. That's where you get a domain ontology. But if it's common across domains, it's what we call the, a common or a mid-level ontology. There is one and only one mid-level ontology that anybody has ever tried to develop. And that was developed um, by my colleagues and I within the US government. And over the past 10 years, I think we've, um, invested about $7 million in developing that mid-level ontology. It's very mature, still needs some more work, but it's going through IEEE, it's going through standardization. Now we're not doing it through ISO because we want to invite individuals to help with developing that. And ISO, it's, you know, it's more of an organization-based standards and you have to pay a significant amount of money just to go to meetings. Um, so we're doing it within IEEE. 
and the domain ontologies um, we're doing within IEEE too. Um, all right, so um, so that's some of our technology that's that's backing up in what we call an integrated um, personal data store. Now, also, most data is for the individual is not going to come from the individual. You know, it's going to come from other organizations. It's like if if you want to to prove what your annual income is. You don't get to make up that number. You have to get that from your employer or maybe from the IRS. Um, so vendors are going to create most of this data. So that data is going to come out of disparate data sources. So what with this, these common ontologies, any, any um, structured data can be mapped to these standard ontologies. Uh, and then once you map them, uh, then the instance data can be transformed and then you can, this data then fits together. It can be queried. It, it's integrated as, as we call it. Um, so, um, you know, we, we envision that the individual will have an integrated data store made up of data coming from many different vendors. And even if it's coming from the same vendor, it could come from five different computer systems from that one vendor and it still can be uh, integrated into a common data store. Um, Okay, so, so this is where, uh, Casey, are you, I, I will stop. Yep, and I'll pick it up from here. I'll let you uh, provide your uh, live tech demo. <clears throat> All right, so to kind of talk about what we have on this screen, on the left-hand side, we have what represents an issuer. They're gonna be the ones issuing credentials. On the right-hand side, we have a holder. This is the individual that receives the credentials, stores it, now to kind of put a little bit of background about what we have on this tech demo, we're utilizing the Sovereign Builder blockchain network with an Aries compatible wallet. So the wallet of choice that we went with with Trinsic, they were um, they took Aries, built some frameworks and APIs around it, and made it accessible. So the whole picture that we were presenting and talking about in the slides was that there are standard ways to issue out credentials. In this case, we have three credentials inside of our issuer's template. Now, what they do is they'll offer a credential by typing in different types of values for uh, the holder. Now, in this case, if you notice, we have, we'll come to the, the credential. The credential has standardized details. So the schema, the credential ID, whether or not it's revocable, but when we get to the attribute level, this is where we start talking about the individual's data. There's no standard way of representing this. So this causes the problem where if multiple issuers are sending credentials, each pointing to the same value, it could be street address, but if the credential references that attribute in a different way, the data doesn't match. So now when the holder receives these credentials, the data models that the credentials map to don't fit together. So here, let me bring up another example. In this example, we have a verifiable credential that was designed to represent, you know, some pieces of a mortgage application. We have a first name, last name, the date, uh, the birth date, address line, city. Now, this these attributes in this verifiable credential are unique to the issuer. So, some issuer decided that I want to receive these attributes, uh, and I'm going to ask the, the holder to provide the information. So what happens next? The issuer on the left-hand side sends a credential to the holder. So we'll pull up to our, our digital wallet. This is what happens. Um, so now the, now, the, now the holder received that verifiable credential from the issuer with the proper values inside the credential. So as you notice, the values are going to be very similar across multiple credentials. You know, if my first name in this example is Jane, I may have four different verifiable credentials that reference that same value, but use a different attribute name other than first name. It could be user first name, first name, name, but we're all referencing the same data, uh, the same data point, which is the, you know, the name Jane. So what we've done in this case is we've created a technology that can accept verifiable credentials, 
then using the ontology technology that Jim talked about, we're able to pull out the data from the verifiable credentials and standardize it in a standard format, making it a lot more reusable across different issuers. So on this page right here, we have an example of what this looks like. We've created a standard representation for first name, last name, while keeping the records of the verifiable credentials. So the way this mapping process works is we select a credential, you select an attribute from the credential, and then map it to our standard model, which would be tree address. Once this data gets generated, it can now then map to our ontology. So the big picture here is we've created a way to make the data inside verifiable credentials reusable across different domains. So let me share my screen to this next part right here. This is what the data looks like underneath the hood inside of an ontology. So as Jim mentioned, when we look at ontologies, the data that we have represents reality, not a data model or a schema. So when we reference, when we talk about standardizing upon values, we're really able to standardize upon any value that an issuer or a verifiable need, verifier needs. So with this example, we're, ta we're taking the, the first name uh, example where we've standardized the attributes for first name. Now we'll start off with this red node right here. This is the ontology representation of, of a person, an individual. Now, I think what's important to note is that it, this is truly the center of the data model because each connection, each representation between the, the individual and the data that they receive has a defined relationship. So in this example, we have a relationship between the individual and their full name. So we say that this individual is designated by a full name. The full name has parts. This is their last name, family name, or their first name, given name. And we map it back to the values, which if you click on it here, you'll see that uh, this will contain the value Doe and this will contain the value Gene. So from this view, we show that we can represent any type of data that we need to. More importantly, I want to talk about this relationship between the person, this red node, and this yellow node, which is the active ownership. So we've represented data that shows how the individual participates in this action, which is this red node right here we represent. And the action has an object, which is the digital wallet. So in this representation, we show how the person has physical attributes associated with them. They have their name, their email address, their street address. And we also showed how our data model can then represent a digital wallet and the relationship between a person and a digital wallet. Now, if we break this further, we'll show how the digital wallet has verifiable credentials in it. And these verifiable credentials track right back to the values. These tan looking boxes are gonna be the values of uh, the attributes. So the important part to show here with all of these nodes and, and edges going along in this graph structure is that we can now represent what's really happening with, in reality when a person has a certain attribute and a verifiable credential maps to it. Bringing us back to this picture right here, when we abstract out the data structure, this picture right here leaves us with a technology that makes these data values more integratable um, across different type of uh, issuers. So that's all I have. I think we'll, um, I'll bring it back to you, Jim. Uh, James, uh, Casey, uh, I do have a question on the ontologies and the attributes. Uh, Casey, sure. there, there was one slide that you showed or, or um, when you were going into the demo, you had a box that had the attributes, first name, last name, and just to me, those are, yeah, yeah, yeah those I mean, are, are the names of the data fields. To what extent, yeah, that's the exact screen I was talking about, first name, yeah. last name. To what extent have you guys mapped those attributes, first name, last name, 
to the MISMO naming standards. Because everything that we do in mortgage um, or what we hope to do in mortgage is really starting to standardize around MISMO and their oh, yeah. naming standards. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one thing that we, we've done is our ontology, the way it maps to different data models like MISMO uh, is, is practically, um, you find a, an attribute inside of a data model. So for example, the way MISMO represents first name and it'll be common among any representation of first name. So I think that the big important part that I wanna make here is that we're not, our ontology will not be a, you know, a MISMO ontology. It won't be a uh, my data ontology. It'll be just a, a, a picture of reality. So I think we could probably say we're probably at a, you know, 20% coverage rate with, with the terms we currently have. But since ontologies are very flexible and you can use a combination of terms to represent, you know, a single term, it allows us to cover a lot more data inside these data models. So that's kind of my, um, my best answer. Jim, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, our approach is very compatible and um, um, complementary. I mean, um, if a person has a wallet, you know, one day they're applying for a mortgage, you know, a month later, they're off using their same wallet, their same data, doing something totally different in some different industry that has its own data model. So, so um, the ontology will be able to map between any structured data models, any structured data. Um, as long as there's a model, um, we can map to it. Um, but also, you know, we are still developing these ontologies. So we will, um, we will factor in the MISMO model so that we make sure we can do a good mapping to, to it. So, uh, so I, and I think, you know, um, if I could move ahead to the next, uh, to the pilot, um, you'll see where we, um, all right. All right, can you see my last slide here? Pilot, yep. proposed pilot. Okay, so this is um, a way in which we can work together here. Um, and, and so our concept is uh, we're proposing that we do, do a pilot in which a, a real person, this is not a just a tech demo. Now we would, just, of course, do these things in a tech demo fashion before the real person is, is uh, introduced <laughs> to, to it. But, uh, but the pilot would be a real person. We would need to recruit a person who is planning to apply for a mortgage. And probably not somebody who needs to get that mortgage in the next month. <laughs> probably somebody who's planning for it in the next um, three to six months. Um, so we'd have to recruit somebody like that. And then the, the team that's going to support this, you know, Casey and I would be on that team. Hopefully we'd re recruit some others. We're going to identify what data and, and credentials are typically needed by mortgage lenders. And um, now some mortgage lenders might need something very unique, but my guess is that uh, the vast majority of pieces of data and specific credentials are common amongst mortgage lenders. Um, now, um, and then, you know, our ontologies might not cover all this data, but we would, we would extend the ontologies and make sure we do cover them <clears throat> so the, that we can then um, have, have a, a draft standard, an emerging standard for a, a person's uh, mortgage application data. Um, and then we'd also have to recruit some, uh, well, okay, so the borrowers, this real person would then gather their real data and credentials, and they would do it privately. Even though this is a pilot, they're not going to share their data unless you know it's in their interest to share their data. Um, probably what we would do is we would have a parallel. Um, we, we have a Jane Doe uh, test bed where we have a, um, a fake person, a, a dummy dummy data. So we'd probably do this in parallel um, and try to collect some of the data um, uh, so that that's, that's more shareable. But, uh, but then also uh, a lot of this data would not be in the right format. So we would have to uh, you know, help that borrower transform the data into the common ontology format. And it does get stored in a triple store. Um, so that um, 
then then the borrower would borrower would uh, post a request for quotes. Um, and of course, we'd have to tip off the lenders. They might not be looking for it, but we'd, we'd go recruit some lenders um, that would agree to try to give this person a, a quote for their uh, for their mortgage. Um, and but the lender would define their terms and conditions, especially when it when it comes to sharing their data. You know, the, and it would be basically, I'm sharing my data for you to give me a quote, but you not you do not keep a copy of my data, and you certainly can't share it or sell it or anything like that. Um, and then if the lender agrees to the terms and conditions, the borrower would then share the data and credentials. Um, and, uh, and then the lender would, would map this data to their applications. Now, my guess is a lender has, has an application, they plug in the information and it, it comes back and computes whether it's a good uh, good loan or not. Um, so there would have to be some mapping that would be done there. Now in the pilot, that would probably be manual. If, but if this were to uh, you know, take off, that mapping could be done in advance. So it could theoretically, quotes could theoretically be given automatically based on in, input data or, or at least a preliminary quote. Um, so so that, that's the type of pilot we think we could uh, you know, help if we could recruit some participants. Um, and that's our offer. <laughs> and it's potentially a way that this could help this ecosystem evolve. Um, because some mortgage borrowers are highly, highly motivated to get a mortgage. I mean, my first mortgage was in 1984 and when interest rates were in the upper teens and my state had some state-backed mortgages, which I stood in line overnight to get a state back more, I was highly motivated to get a mortgage. If I was told I got to collect a bunch of data credentials, no problem, I would have done that. Um, so it could contribute to the, you know, this vision of an ecosystem. Uh, okay, uh, Jim, Casey, I, I think you guys are looking for a couple things. You want uh, a real person or several real people to go through this process to set up a, uh, a, a digital wallet and then to go through the mortgage application process, but you're also looking for lenders or uh, mortgage companies that would be willing to accept those credentials as part of the mortgage application process, or have you guys already identified those types of companies? No, no we don't. We don't know the lenders. We we hope you do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So then you are proposing a pilot that would where there are going to be real people and there are going to be uh, lenders with a loan origination system that would accept the credentials that you guys would identify or you guys would develop. That's what you guys are looking for in your pilot. Yes, and and the the first implementation that that mortgage lender, you know, is going to get these data and credentials, and they're probably going to manually have to replug it into their applications or whatever um, for the pilot purposes. But theoretically, that could all be automated, um, you know, because these these um, ontologies, this data can be mapped to any other app, you know, unique business application. Um. Okay. Well, uh, there are several lenders and, and quite a few people that work with lenders that are a part of this group. Um, Jim, Casey, uh, if you guys could put your contact information in the chat and then for anyone on the call, anyone that downloads this recording and is interested in participating at, uh, or, or helping out your pilot, I would encourage them to reach out to you either as a real person taking, uh, getting mortgage quotes or being uh, one of the lenders that would uh, provide those quotes and, and help process the mortgage application. Okay, that, <clears throat> that would be great. Okay, great. Uh, thank you guys for walking us through this information and, and this pilot. Uh, I think it, I think it leverages the type of 
blockchain technology and use case that we advocate for in our subgroup. And I think this is great technology that is gonna be useful and it's just um, getting a pilot out there. I think that's usually the hardest part. So if there's anyone that's interested or can help you, I encourage them to reach out to you. Appreciate it, thank you. Okay, thanks guys. Thank, so, thank you. <clears throat> um, are, are there any questions from the rest of the team for, uh, Jim and, and Casey, uh, I think they walked us through uh, an excellent presentation and demo and I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. So any questions for the rest of the team? Yeah, Jim, Casey, take, we appreciate you taking the time to walk through this. It's a fantastic idea that you guys got. So hopefully we'll be able to get you connected with some potentials. Okay, uh, thanks again, guys. And I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So going back to future agenda topics, um, we do have someone lined up for our October 13th uh, meeting. This is going to be David Fitzgerald. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, property records and a smart contract project that he did in Wise County. I think this may have been something that we've covered or briefly mentioned in an earlier meeting, but David will be able to walk through us through this project in a lot more detail. I, I think it's another example of a great use case for blockchain. So hopefully you guys can join that. Uh, the meeting after that, November 10th, we're contemplating a blockchain panel discussion or another demo from another blockchain uh, LOS provider. I'm still trying to finalize that. And then December 8th. So those are future agenda topics. If there's anything that um, the people on this call are interested in uh, or would like to discuss, please let us know either in the chat or, or shoot us an email. We wanna make this as interactive as possible and also support the interests of the whole entire team. Um, with that, uh, that brings us to the end of our session. Uh, I want to open it up to any questions, uh, any feedback from the, the rest of, of the team and participants. Yeah, I, I can see that uh, Jim and Casey entered their information into the chat. So thank you guys. Okay, um, if there aren't any questions, I, I show 948. Thank you to everyone for joining this call. Uh, this call has been recorded and will be available in the next couple of days when the Hyperledger team converts it and posts it onto the YouTube link. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your day.